for today. George Lakey recently retired as professor at Swarthmore College and published his ninth book, Viking Economics, How the Scandinavians Got It Right and How Can We Too. He has led over 1,500 social change workshops on five continents. He was the first arrested in the civil rights movement, then most recently with the Earth Quaker Action Team. Other leadership was in the peace, gay, economic justice, and men's anti-sexist movements. Please welcome George Lake. So happy to be here. My first time here was in the 50s. <laughs> when, as an undergraduate, I came here and listened to Milton Mayer, who was an amazingly ethical writer and an inspiration to me. And who knew when I was 19 that someday I'd be a writer, among other things. But here I am getting to share with you some of what I learned about a part of the world that I think is very relevant to the question of ethics. This may help. Does this help? Good. Yes, why talk if we can't be heard? <laughs> right. <laughs> It was actually an accident that I got to the Nordic countries because when I fell in love with the woman who became my wife, uh, she, I learned very quickly that she was Norwegian, but I had no idea where Norway was. <laughs> and I wear this to remind myself. <laughs> but uh, she, she, uh, she was actually being pursued at the same time by another guy in the Quaker Summer Project where we were. And so I had to run very fast, especially feeling outdone by the fact that he not only knew where Norway was geographically, <laughs> he even knew where her town was. And that struck me as extremely unfair. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, a couple of years later, I found myself on a ship, thanks to my grandfather loaning money to his lovelorn grandson. And uh, on my way to Norway, five days after getting off the boat, we got married. Which helped to motivate me to learn Norwegian because I was curious about what was it the priest said. <laughs> it was very reassuring to find out what he said, what I had agreed to. I also was interested in learning the language because her family didn't actually speak English. Nowadays, Norwegian, Swedes, Danes, they all, everybody speaks English pretty much. But in those days, you know, a lot of people didn't, and her family didn't. So if I was going to have a real relationship with them, I was going to have to speak their language directly. And I was very motivated to get to know and win them over because they started out with a prejudice against Americans. They thought Americans were very uncouth and way too prone to assassinate their presidents and uh, just you know, kind of a violent lot. And why would their daughter be willing to come to this weird, savage place? So I needed to be at least polite enough to learn their language and enjoy doing so. Well, I never guessed that I would actually get to write about that place. I was fascinated with it. And part of it was the uh, stranger in the strange land experiences that I kept having. For example, uh, Barrett said that we could, I could continue my undergraduate education by going to the University of Oslo and that it would be free. I'm a skeptical guy actually by nature, so I thought this can't really be true. So on the first day, the matriculation day, I put down my $14 matriculation fee <laughs> and waited for the other shoe to drop and no other shoe dropped. So I turned to a Norwegian guy who I was making friends with, a, a, a student, and I said, Sigrid, what sense does it make for a country to provide higher education for free to its people? And he said, George, look, wouldn't you say that 
from an economic point of view, that brain power is a major economic resource for a country. Well, yes, I would say that. Okay, well, he said, in that case, why would it make any sense for a country to hold back in the full development of its economic resources by putting a price tag on the full development of its brain power? Hmm. So I thought about that all the way home as I walked home because I was thinking... I did have a story, of course, about why they were doing this free higher education thing. Um, did, have you ever made up a story about something even though you don't really know quite very much about it, but it's just comforting to have a story? So I had a story that the Norwegians were doing this as a fling. <laughs> a fling to their idealism. You know, so we'll do this higher education free thing, and that will make us feel very good about ourselves. So we'll just prove all the more how superior we are. And that they made it up, made it up in other ways. It didn't occur to me what Seeger said. That is that there would actually be pragmatic economic payoff <laughs> to doing the right thing. The right thing by their lights. Which was to promote equality and individual freedom through higher education for free. Well that really uh, shook me. Because I've been brought up believing that there are two worlds that we inhabit. We inhabit a moral or ethical world of values. That's one world. And then another world we occupy is the world of practical results. Pragmatic calculus. Realism. And that these two worlds are separate. And that our existential dilemma as human beings is to work with this tension that exists and try to come up with you know, with what we could make out within our lives but just understand that these are two worlds but this was a very strong signal to me from them that maybe those two worlds don't exist as two worlds maybe there's one world that maybe when you do what's right it turns out also to be practical in other terms so a lot of my interest in researching the book, which Swarthmore College backed me up on, was to discover, were there other synergies like that? Were there other situations in which the Norwegians, and I was also studying the Danes and Swedes and Icelanders, found that while they were doing the right thing, they were also doing the economically beneficial thing. So guess what I discovered? That when they provide free health care for everybody, and it's a highly uh, a, a system that's geared to individual needs in a very high degree. For example, if you happen to live north of the Arctic Circle, I don't know if you know that Norway is a very long and skinny country. Very long. It's actually pretty big. It's bigger than Great Britain in, in size. Um, but it stretches way up to the Arctic Circle. And if you took Oslo as a pivot, if you put your finger on that and then move the country around, it would reach Rome. So it's this very long country. And if you happen to live north of the Arctic Circle and you developed a brain tumor that was so complicated to deal with that it required a surgeon and the apparatus in the university hospital at the other end of the country, then the health service flies you down to Oslo in order to get your brain tumor taken care of. And for them, that's a no-brainer. It's just... Well, obviously, that's what you need, so we fly you down there to make sure you're taken care of. That's their healthcare system in a nutshell. Uh, when, when I uh, got the flu, uh, when, we, when we moved to Oslo, Barrett and I, uh, she said, okay, so I'll find a family physician because in Norway we love to have a primary care physician that we can count on. Okay, so uh, she got somebody, uh, but we didn't need anybody until later in the winter when I got the flu and I felt so miserable. I thought I couldn't get out of bed. So he came, paid a house call. And then at the end, he, said, he gave me a, a piece of paper that said what his bill was. He said, so the way we do things here is that you pay me now in cash for what I did. And then when you're well, you'll take this chip paper to the office, which has a set of windows, something like a post office, and you hand that over to the clerk. And then they give you your money back. Mine was a very small service fee. Do you 
know anything simpler than that. <laughs> and uh, of course, systems don't stay the same, so it's a little different now. But nevertheless, that really impressed me with its sheer practicality. And yet, it seemed like, well, a very idealistic thing. Huh? A country decides to take care of its people and simply collects the taxes necessary in order to take care of every single person. So, even a foreigner, even an American student who fell in love with no reason. So, uh, it was only do it through doing the research for the book that I discovered the point that Seagard would have made. <laughs> Seagard would have said, do you know that we actually pay less as a nation for our healthcare system than you do? And I found that it was true. They pay about two thirds for their healthcare system per capita that we pay for our healthcare system. And our healthcare system doesn't even cover millions and millions of people. Whoa. And the Norwegians found something else. They found that their workers were more economically productive when they were healthy. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't think, would you, that people are more productive when they're healthy? <laughs> but uh, that's what, and Norway loves a productive economy. So on two counts, it turns out that this thing that appears to be very ethical, maybe almost like crazy ethical, like, well, take care of everybody's medical needs, uh, turns out to be <laughs> not only producing a healthier people who actually then produce more economically, but also save them money. In other words, if you went to Norway and say, said, guess what? You can have the American healthcare system. Wouldn't that be wonderful? They would say, are you crazy? And we would pay one third more than we do nationally in order to get your system? Why would we do that? Hmm. Over and over and over. I made, I made friends with an immigrant from Burundi. We were on the same bus going someplace and I, I chatted him up, which he said was a bit unusual because he found Norwegians anyway, didn't seem to want to talk to anybody. There's like a lot of personal space. He found that somebody from Burundi where people are talking all the time, spending lots of time in the market, just really enjoying, them, enjoying sociability. He found that very cold and, and weird about Norwegians. Um, but I, I said, uh, so what's been like for you as an immigrant? Because there's a lot of speculation in the United States about how immigration goes in, in various countries. He said, well, I can tell you my story. What happened was that I sat down with a government worker in Oslo, and he said, okay, so we offer you a deal. This is the deal, take it or leave it. We will offer you uh, to, to pay you a living wage for a year. In return, you need to, A, learn the Norwegian language. And if you start drop, you know, dropping out of your classes, not showing up on time, we'll stop your pay. <coughs> you need to think seriously, learning the Norwegian language. You also need to learn our culture, take lessons in that. You need to learn job skills that are marketable in our country, because maybe you're an awesome something or other in Burundi that we don't happen to make or, or use. So you need to learn something that you know, will, uh, will work here. And you need to be willing to be put in the country someplace where we want you to be. And that may be the hardest of all, he said, because we might put you in a remote fishing village in the western fjords where there will be nobody your color anywhere near. And it may be the loneliest year of your life. But that's how, that's the deal. You have to agree to all of that. And if it turns out that your language, your native language is so different from ours that you need more time, that's possible we can do an extension. So we'll keep paying you your wage while you learn more language before, you know, before you know. What do you want to do? It's up to you. You can leave or you can stay under these conditions. And he said, oh, I'll stay. So he said, I said, what was it like? He said, it was the loneliest year of my life that <laughs> there I was. I didn't know anybody. And I, I kept interpreting as racist the uh, aversion that Norwegians seemed to have to check me up. 
Um, but then I looked around and I really, as I got to know the culture better and observed them more closely, I realized they didn't talk to each other either. <laughs> <laughs> and bit by bit, and buddy, and so of course there was racism, but bit by bit, I got to know uh, to know how to navigate in this country. And uh, and I said, then what did you do? He said, well, after the year, I, went, I had learned, I met all the requirements. I did go back to Oslo where there'd be more of my people to hang out with. But he said, I fell in love with an ethnically Norwegian woman, and we, uh, you know, we joined the church together, and we have a baby, and I'm in the church band, and thanks so much for your music, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I'm in the band, and I, I'm having a great life, he said. I said, well, that's very interesting. So I checked with policy people who are, are in the government who work with immigration, and uh, with his story, and, and he, they said, yeah, that's a typical story. Not everybody experiences that, but that's a fairly typical arrangement that we make. Very contractual. Okay, so right away, I'm trying to understand in terms of this diplomatic uh, business. Um, it seems very, a very ethical uh, way. It seems very self-respecting for the Norwegians to say, we need you to do this. It's very contractual. It's very respectful of the other person because they can say yes or no. And they can you know, go, go and see if they can get better to somewhere else. So it seemed very adult, adult, very respectful uh, uh, contractual relationship. Um, so I noticed that. But it also requires uh, the Norwegians to put up front a tremendous investment in this person. And he's got a caseworker to get a hold of you. So that's a lot of investment. So you could say, well, that's one of those idealistic trips that those Scandinavians are into. You know, uh, guess what? Pays on. Because at the end of that the upfront investment of a year, that person is in joining to the economy and able to be productive and able to move things forward. So, uh, time after time after time, I kept finding these synergies between what is practical, what, what enables them to be a more high performing economy than the United States. They have more startups, for example, than we do. And when I found that out, I was a little bit insulted. I mean, my country, center of capitalism, we should have more startups than anybody. No, we don't have more startups than anybody. They have more startups. But I explained the reasons in the book that has to do with uh, to take the risk of doing a startup. Let's say you're 45 years old and you have this great entrepreneurial idea that you want to quit your job and do, right? It takes you full time to really develop this idea. But in this country, you think, yeah, but uh, the kids are about ready to go to college. I better not do this because, you know, if it doesn't work out, I can't pay their way. And besides, um, uh, then I lose my health care because it's attached to my employer. So that's an issue. And, and then what if the, I bet the farm and it all falls apart and then there goes my retirement. But none of those things is an issue over there. It's the best, uh, it, the international ratings say it's the best place in the world to be an elder. Because there's universal pension. As well as universal uh, availability of higher education. As well as medical care. And so on and so on. So that means that the bright eye, uh, you know, the gleam in the eye folks who want to be entrepreneurs in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland have a head start. They are supported by their society to follow their dream. In fact, there's even encouragement over there for you to quit your job if you don't, if you get up in the morning and don't want to go to work. <laughs> you, know, you feel like I'm no longer fulfilling myself. This isn't really what I, you know. Or I'm just tired of it. I want something, a new challenge, whatever. They say, quit your job. Quit. <laughs> And go somewhere else and get a different job. Oh, you need new training? You, you, you remember that when you were in college you thought, wouldn't it be great to be a lawyer? Well, go to law school. You know, do it. It's free. Or, hey, I want to be able to play the piano like, like this guy. Well, go to music school. It's free. Get retrained. You, you missed out on going to sea. There's a kind of tradition in those countries of people a few years, you know, in their young, young adulthood spending at sea, but you missed out on that chance. Uh, but you'd like to uh, serve in the merchant marine as an engineer, but you don't have those skills. Great! 
go to engineering school, it's free, get trained to do nautical work, and then go on a ship and have yourself involved for the next 10 years. Good. They just change jobs like uh, some people change furniture. Because, again, investment in individual people is regarded not only as an ethical obligation of an economy, but also as something that enormously pays off. Because guess what? People who are who like their jobs, people who find job satisfaction, are more productive than people who go and play video games, you know, while they're pretending to work. <laughs> who knew? So this this is one of the things that hit me over and over and over. The things that for Americans do make common sense because I've been on book tour now since July, and every time I tell this kind of story, people nod like, oh yeah, all well, that makes sense, well that makes sense, well that makes sense, well that makes sense, huh. Well, all these things make sense, then it turns out both ethically and practically these things work together. And so I think it challenges that worldview that I brought, was brought up with, that there's always this tension between these two worlds of the ethical and the pragmatic, then maybe we just need more boldness to be willing to implement the ethical and see how it works. Because it is possible to be experimental. They've made mistakes and backed off some of the things that they did because it wasn't making sense. They love to study things, see how things work. And we could do that too. I think. <laughs> now I know, some people say, and the last chapter of my book addresses many of these concerns. Well, you, you can do it in a small country what you can't do it in a large country. Um, actually, there are plenty of times when in our country we try something in the lab, it works, and then we try it on a larger scale and find it works. In fact, trying stuff out in a small lab is a sensible thing to do when you're not sure if something works or not. And then you apply it larger if it does work. I happened to run into, um, well, I was visiting a research uh, institute in Oslo, and as I was about to go to the conference room to meet with a couple of the researchers, I found on the wall a photograph, a uh, number of photographs. One of the photographs showed a group of Chinese people. They looked Chinese to me. So I asked the researchers, I said, those folks look Chinese. And the researcher said, yeah, they, uh, they were sent from Beijing, they're economists, policy people, and they were sent by the People's Republic of China to come here and learn what they could from Norway. My jaw dropped open. Because China makes the United States of America look small by comparison. And they also make the United States look homogeneous by comparison. Because China is way more heterogeneous than we are. And the Chinese government thought it should send people to Norway to find stuff that they could use. So the, the, the researchers I was about to interview uh, saw my jaw drop, you know, and, and they laughed. And they said, we wondered the same thing. So as soon as we brought them into our conference room, we said, OK, so what are you doing here? <laughs> And the Chinese expected the question, and they said, look, we're economists, we look at economy in a very complex way. We understand that there are some features of an economy that cannot be scaled up, that happen to work best on a small scale and don't scale up. And that there are other features of an economy that do scale up, work small, can work large, also. And the same with culture. Then there's some things that are culturally very specific and other things that culturally don't have from an economic point of view. So we're here to find out what we can scale up and what will, what will work in the Chinese culture. And that's why we're here. So that got me thinking in a whole different way. And so one of the things I thought about was in Iceland they have for 325,000 people a social security system. Well, for the United States of America, 330 million people, we have a social security system. I mean, ours is stingier than theirs is. <laughs> but it still is a system that actually works. And even though there was great resistance to putting it into place at the time, 
there were people say, oh, that's a communist lot, or that's a, you know, a foreign import. We wouldn't want to do a social security system in our country. They do it in Europe. That's a Europe thing. That's not the American thing. Um, nevertheless, do you, do you know anybody, seriously, who would like to abandon the social security system? Uh, or think of Medicare. Think of Medicare. That's a more recent import. Okay, the, those countries, uh, those small countries do find the Medicare. Uh, again, our Medicare system is more stingy than theirs because they really put health on such a high plane. But nevertheless, uh, we, our Medicare system studies show has way higher customer satisfaction than do private health care plans. It works. In a big country, it works in a small country. So this thing that I thought might be a real problem, scaling up and doing something, you know, that was working in a relatively homogeneous society, uh, trying to make that work in a heterogeneous society, hey, the Chinese are right. <laughs> it just depends on which feature. And so if we were to adopt the, the Nordic model, then we would want to be discerning and we would try to figure out which of the things that can be scaled up. And if it can be scaled up, then why not? I mean, think, think of higher, free higher education. New York City had it for decades. Some of you know. They had it for decades. The most diverse city in the country, the largest city in the country, and they had free higher education, CCNY, for a very long time. Why was that given up? That's worth the study right there, right? And, and California, I'm just back from California two weeks on speak tour and, uh, about the book. And again, they, they were used virtually free higher education for a very long time. And again, very, very heterogeneous and uh, in some ways the largest state, uh, one of the largest states in the country. It's got the fifth largest economy in the world. China does. I mean, it's in California. Does. <laughs> so so for, for all these reasons, I, I, I would say, hmm, why wouldn't we want to do what's sensible and what's practical and what's ethical for our people. And why wouldn't we demand that? So then, in the book, you can imagine, I had to go into that question. How did they get it? Is it that they are super rational beings who can do, who could be, be so uh, thoughtful as to do this? Well, a century ago, they had an enormous wealth gap, like we do, they had enormous poverty, like we do. They had a pretend democracy in which they had a parliament. Yes, each of those countries had a parliament. Yes, they had free elections. But somehow, the majority might think one thing, but the country would do what the economic elite wanted. I would say we have a pretend democracy. So they in some ways were very similar a century ago to the way we are now. So what they had to do was turn themselves around. And it took nonviolent revolution to be able to do that. And I actually tell the story of that in the book because it's very dramatic. How did they dig in to that struggle and push their economic elite out of the leadership of their countries so that they could establish actual democracy and invent the Nordic model, which nobody had invented before. So that's an exciting story for me. Because I'm an American. Did I stay in Norway? I had a great job, great adopted family, very stable and amazing society with many benefits for me. I could have you know, gotten a PhD there. I could have done all this stuff. Did I stay there? No. I came back. My wife wanted to come back. She said, the U.S. needs us. That was her, like, maybe a little bit condescending view. <laughs> My view was different. It was very much more a sense of identity. I really feel involved with my people. You are my people. We are together in this. And I wanted to cast my lot with our future. I thought I wouldn't get a chance to write this book. I thought that Americans wouldn't be interested enough in finding out how other th people do things to even make it worth the while to spend seven years doing that research and interviewing 
and writing. But I spent the seven years because I did have a sense my people can be humble enough and curious enough to learn from the positive experience of others. So that's what I did. And I'm so pleased to be able to bring that message here, here of all places, where I first came through that door in the 50s. What a treat to be back. Thank you so much. Yeah.